Welcome to Russian History Retold. Episode 196. Things you didn't know about the Soviet Union. Most of us in the West were not told about a lot of positive things that went on in the Soviet Union, and the Soviet leaders didn't want the West to know anything negative about what was going on in their country. Today's episode is my attempt to rectify things. If I miss anything, please message me on Facebook through the Russian Rulers History page. The first little-known fact is that the Soviet space program was the first one to put a man-made item on another planet. The Soviet Venera 7 was launched on August 17, 1970, and made it to Venus on December 15th. After landing on the planet, the craft sent back only 23 minutes of weak data, presumably because it landed on its side. It wasn't until 1976 that the United States space program landed on the planet, that being Viking 1 on Mars. Next up is one of my favorites, and it has to do with Riza Gorbachev, Mikhail's wife. During the Gorbachev's visit to England in December of 1984, Riza told British Agriculture Minister Michael Jopling that there were more than 300 ways to cook potatoes in the USSR. When he doubted her claim, she promised to send him a cookbook, which she did a few months later, noting, quote, My apologies for being somewhat inaccurate. In fact, there are 500 rather than 300 recipes to cook potatoes. During the Cold War between the United States and the USSR, Soviet directors actually won three Oscar awards for Best Foreign Language Film. They were War and Peace in 1968, Dursu Uzla in 1975, and Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears in 1980. It is said that because economic success was not crucial to the Soviet directors, they were able to make more philosophical films with deeper meanings than their American counterparts. The most famous of the Soviet directors was Andrei Tarkovsky, who was considered one of the greatest directors of the 20th century. Laika, the world-famous dog that the Soviet space program sent into outer space in 1957, was actually a stray dog that was wandering the streets of Moscow before being picked up and selected to be the first mammal to go into orbit. Part of the scientists involved thought that if Laika could survive the streets of Moscow, especially in the winter, she would be the ideal subject for the flight. Prior to Laika going into orbit, no one really knew if animals or man could survive in outer space. At the time, they didn't even know how a rocket would return to Earth, so the dog's survival was never expected. Laika supposedly died within hours after the launch because of overheating, according to the reports released by the Russian government in 2002. The official statement at the time, though, was that the dog was euthanized before she was to run out of oxygen. We all owe a debt of gratitude to the part husky, part terrier, Laika. The Soviets liberated Auschwitz, the largest killing center and concentration camp, in January 1945. Actually, the USSR liberated more concentration camps than the rest of the Allies combined. This was not surprising as many of the camps were in Poland, where the Soviet troops ousted the Germans. The, quote, liberation of Poland was a topic that I may cover in the future as it cost the lives of thousands of Poles because of Stalin's orders to hold back Soviet troops, allowing the Nazis to kill many more Polish people. Staying in the time of World War II, the fight between the Soviet troops and the Nazis led to 95% of all German casualties in the war, numbering about 1 million men. Still, this pales in comparison to the losses suffered by the Soviet army. It has been estimated they lost around 5 million men and women in the fighting that went on between 1941 and the end of the war in 1945. No wonder they call the conflict the Great Patriotic War. Adding to the horrific losses suffered by the Soviet people during the war, it is estimated that nearly 80% of the Soviet males born in 1923 did not survive World War II. This led to substantial economic problems after the war, 
but the Soviet Union was able to recover in short order. Being an able-bodied man post-war would present you with a lot of female companions with which to choose from. There was a real problem that arose due to the slow population growth that occurred because of this fact. Now here's an interesting one. It was pretty common knowledge that many products made in the USSR were inferior to those produced in the West. But did you know that this was a primary reason why many foreign spies were found out? Turns out the staples used in Soviet passports rusted because they had iron in them, while the United States used stainless steel. So according to the KGB files that were opened after the fall of the USSR, hundreds of American agents were caught because their fake Soviet passports had the wrong staples that were made of stainless steel instead of the ones that were of poor quality. Now, here's a fact that even I had never heard of before researching this episode's podcast. On September 20th, 1963, in a speech before the UN General Assembly, American President Kennedy proposed that the United States and the Soviet Union join forces in their efforts to reach the moon. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was poised to accept Kennedy's proposal, But after the American president was assassinated in November of that year, Khrushchev rejected the plan because he didn't trust Vice President Johnson. What might have been had Kennedy lived? Heading off to a completely different direction, did you know that the Soviet Union produced one of the most popular video games in history? Tetris was created by Russian programmer Alexei Pajitnov, in 1984, while he was working for the Doritsyan Computing Center of the Academy of Science of the USSR in Moscow. He derived its name from the Greek numerical prefix tetra, because of all the game's pieces contained four segments and tennis, Pajitnov's favorite sport. It was released in the West two years later and sold almost 200 million copies since, making it one of the biggest selling video games ever. The spy game during the Cold War sometimes elicited some really bizarre means of getting information from the other side. One incident occurred in 1980 when Soviet scientists went to the Boeing plant in Seattle. The men put adhesives on their soles of their shoes to pick up fragments of metals to analyze them afterwards while walking through the facility. According to KGB files, the incident was a complete success. Another interesting one. Uh, General Georgi Zhukov was responsible for the introduction of a drink known as White Coke. He was fond of the Americans' Coca-Cola, but didn't want to be seen in public drinking it because of its distinct color. Zhukov ordered a clear version to be made, which looked more like vodka than what it really was. And it was General Dwight D. Eisenhower who gave his Soviet counterpart his first taste of the addictive drink. In one of those purported facts, and let me tell you, I did quite a bit of research online to to find these things out, and I wanted to verify some, but there's some that were likely to be fiction and that were presented as fact. Now, it's said that in the Soviet Russia, some prisoners who were scared for their lives got tattoos of Lenin or Stalin or both put on their chest or other parts of their bodies because guards weren't allowed to shoot at images of their national leaders. I find this a bit absurd because to, all they had to do was sh- to uh, shoot the prisoner was to clothe them up or cover up any such tattoo. I mean, even when trying to find obscure facts, one comes across a bunch of things that likely never really happened. Another supposed fact that has been spread around that I found untrue was how Nikita Khrushchev allowed the first Russian vodka distillery to be constructed in the 1950s. And that was in the United States, of course. Uh, Well, that's kind of bogus because the first one was the Smirnov plant built in 1933. Vladimir Smirnov, son of the founder Pyotr, sold Rudolf Kunit the right to begin producing Smirnov vodka in North America. The sales, though, of the Russian drink were abysmal, which forced him to sell the rights to Hublin, an import-export company specializing in alcohol. Stales still stunk as Americans at the time were mainly whiskey drinkers. A smart marketeer tried a new tact, calling vodka white whiskey, 
with no taste or smell. It worked, and now vodka is one of the largest selling spirits in America. Staying with the alcohol theme, now here's a fascinating one. Beer wasn't considered alcohol in the Soviet Union. It was categorized as a soft drink. This allowed it to be drunk openly in public and sold in street kiosks. It wasn't until 2011 that it was reclassified as an alcoholic beverage. Another fact is that many believe that Gorbachev's attempt at lowering the drinking problem in the Soviet Union accelerated its collapse. Mikhail's answer to what was and still is a significant issue, especially amongst young Russians, was to ban the sale of alcohol. Problem was, this caused many to make their own distilleries or buy it from the black market. This, in turn, caused a considerable drop in sales tax income, nearly bankrupting the Soviet government. Many people in the West believe that the Concorde airplane was the first passenger jet to fly faster than the speed of sound, but they would be wrong. Those honors belong to the Tupelo Tu-144, the USSR's only supersonic transport that first flew on December 31, 1968, near Moscow, two months before the first flight of the Concorde. Unfortunately, the Tupolev was not the most reliable plane out there. In fact, it had many very public failures over the years, with one occurring at the Paris Air Show in 1973 when it crashed. Overall, there were only 55 commercial flights of the Tupolev, with it being used later as a cargo plane for only another 47 times, so for only a total of 102 commercial flights. The Soviets used the plane primarily as a training aircraft after that for members of their space program. During the Cold War, the Soviets and the United States tried to always outdo each other as ways to propagandize their achievements. Nuclear weaponry was one of those ways to show how powerful and superior they were to their opponent. The Tsar Bomba was the nickname for the AN-602 hydrogen bomb, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever detonated. Its test on October 30th, 1961, remained the most powerful man-made explosion in human history and produced a mushroom cloud over seven times the height of Mount Everest. The shock wave circled the earth three times and caused window panes to be partially broken at distances of up to 900 kilometers or 560 miles. This is one example of what would have been unleashed had the Cold War turned hot. Our world as we know it would have been incinerated. The siege of Leningrad from September of 1941 until January of 1944 was one of the great humanitarian tragedies of World War II and of all time. The 873-day siege cost the lives of around 1.5 million people, making it the most significant loss of life in a city in human history. One of the little-known facts is that a group of scientists trapped in the city boxed up a cross-section of seeds and moved them to the basement of the Hermitage Museum in an effort to protect the world's largest seed bank. They refused to eat its content despite being starved, and by the end of the siege in the spring of 1944, nine of them had died of starvation. To show how powerful the Soviet propaganda machine was, Soviet newspapers wouldn't report on anything that wasn't directly, quote, in favor of the Soviet Union. The bad news was hidden because, quote, the belief was that under communist rule, nothing goes wrong because they were always right. People were never aware of trains derailing or airplanes crashing or murders or major robberies happening. Leonid Brezhnev was said to have been an atrocious driver as he killed dozens of pedestrians in Moscow during his time as head of the USSR. But no one knew about it. While Coca-Cola and McDonald's are famous for being some of the first Western companies to enter the Soviet Union, it was Pepsi that got there first. They arrived in Moscow's Sokolignyky Park in 1959, where the soda was given out for free in disposable paper cups. Thirteen years later, Pepsi got a deal done with the Soviets to distribute Stolichnaya Vodka, That deal was rescinded post-Soviet dissolution. Soviet breadlines were notorious for being very, very long. 
But according to many who lived then, that's not even half the story of it. During her time in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, Dr. Naomi Collins said that exhaustion stalked her in the efforts of daily living. Even buying staples like cheese and rice took forever because you had to stand in long lines for nearly every item you wanted. Even after waiting, you didn't get the item directly. You had to claim vouchers at each station and pay a cashier before then going back to the stations and picking up your items. I saw this personally when I visited East Germany in 1970 with my father. The long line we came across, some three blocks long, was for toilet paper. When my dad asked one of the people in the line what they were waiting for, they said, I don't know, but whatever it is, I probably need it. Poverty was one thing that Soviet officials refused to admit to, especially in the 1960s until the end. The American idea of soup kitchens was proposed by a U.S. diplomat, but that was rejected, quote, because they insisted it simply did not exist. One Soviet official said, we are opposed to this system, where pure, poor people get free dinner. Psychologically, it's a strange idea to us. We will not consider such a variant. In 1989, it took a Soviet worker 10 times longer to earn a pound of meat than it did the average American. While the Soviet propaganda machine was in full motion, it was presented to the people that the leadership was going through the same tough struggles as everyone else. And of course, this could not have been any further from the truth. Konstantin Simis reported in 1984 that the ruling elite in Moscow despite there being a nation, nationwide food shortage, ate like kings using the so-called Kremlin Canteen. The canteen was a network of special stores that sold food of particularly high quality to those with special passes. Quote, sausages, fish delicacies, cheeses, bread, vodka, cakes, as well as fruits and vegetables produced and grown on state farms that supply the canteen system exclusively. There were also American cigarettes, Scotch whiskey, English gin, and pharmacies that sold drugs you couldn't find anywhere else in the country. So much for the communist utopia. Earlier I mentioned how Soviet dictator or directors were awarded three Oscars, but Hollywood wasn't the favorite movie-making mecca to the Soviet people. It was India's Bollywood instead. The reoccurring themes of the triumph of good over evil also resonated with the crowd. So strong was the love for Indian cinema that actor Raj Kapoor was as famous in the Soviet Union as he was in his homeland. During the Cold War, another contest, you might say, went on between the two superpowers. And this one was about who could dig the deepest hole. By 1994, the Soviet Union dug the Kola Super Deep Borehole, and at the time it was the deepest hole in the world. Located in the Murmansk region in the Kola Peninsula, the shaft penetrated 12 kilometers or 7.5 miles of the Earth's 30-kilometer or 18.6-mile crust. The process unearthed evidence of biologic activity in the Earth that was more than 2 billion years old. While I've mentioned this scientific quack in one of my previous episodes, Trofim Lysenko was a certified nut job. First of all, Lysenko didn't believe in natural selection. Uh, he claimed that animals and plants all consciously work together and transform themselves to create the most perfect version of the world as possible, just like in communism. Stalin loved this thought and forced all other scientists in the Soviet Union to go along with this nonsense. On top of it, Lysenko claimed one type of plant could just spontaneously become a completely different kind of plant, like wheat magically turning into barley under the right environmental factors. He went further to say that animals could give birth to other species under the right circumstances. Around 3,000 biologists lost their jobs and or life because they dared suggest that a dog couldn't give birth to a cat if the conditions called for it. Did you also know that the Soviets had dozens of secret cities? Ozyorsk was one example of these mysterious cities. 
There were no buses that stopped there, no road signs pointing towards it. Its post was addressed to Chelyabinsk 65, although the city of Chelyabinsk was nearly 50 miles away. Ozyorsk was unknown to the West, despite being home to tens of thousands of people. To top it off, its existence was unknown even in Russia until 1986. The secrecy was because it was the home of a nuclear fuel processing plant. This particular processing plant exploded in 1957, but because of the confidentiality of its location, the disaster was named after another town seven miles away. The town was Kaishtim. There are 42 cities like this that we've heard of, but also around 15 more that people suspect Russia is still hiding. Residents of these cities were gifted with better food, schools and luxuries than the rest of the country. This was the appeal of many Soviet citizens to stay in these places. We know that the American spy agency, the CIA, had numerous operatives in the Soviet Union. Things could get downright scary at times, but also comical, like this story. As recounted by the book The Billion Dollar Spy, one CIA officer new to Moscow was amused to sometimes reach for his coat, only to find it had vanished, reappearing sometime later with listening devices, of course, implanted. The American's apartment was bugged and his lines were tapped. Once he used an unsecured line to set up dinner at a restaurant with friends. While driving to the restaurant, he figured out that the cars behind him and in front of him were KGB surveillance. At some point in the drive, he and his wife kind of got lost, so they decided just to follow the KGB to see what would happen. They took him straight to the restaurant, of course. Spying on our spies was a real-life game during the Cold War. After the fall of the USSR, we learned that the KGB never sent their own officers They simply didn't trust their people to be alone with CIA case officers. Also, they never used people who were strangers to the CIA in question. They didn't want them to be, you know, suddenly appear. Uh, The guy you bumped into at a party once, who now wants to give you information. Now, that's a good chance that he's working in the service of the KGB. The guy you've never seen before? Nah, he's likely not a threat. Well, I hope you enjoyed our ride through the times between 1917 and 1991 of the Soviet Union. Join me next time when I try to present the same things about pre-Soviet times with things you didn't know about Russia. So until next time, до свидания и спасибо большое.